Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series. In just a minute, I'll be thrilled to roll out this week's seminar with David Layden, from, uh, a good colleague from IBM Quantum. Uh, I'm so glad that you have already joined us on time. Before we begin with introductions and let David jump in here, let's give everyone just about a minute or two to tune into the live stream. Meanwhile, I think most of you are already uh, getting ahead of my favorite question, which is, where are you guys tuning in from? Where's everybody uh, tuning into our seminar today? Now, you can reply to that in the same place where you can reply to uh, David and myself, as well as ask questions live during the talk and really have an interactive discussion. That's the comment chat box on uh, YouTube, which is somewhere on your screen, either left, right, above, or below. I'm sure you can find it. Um, we turned off the subscriber mode, so hopefully that works out well. So now, in principle, any and all of you should be able to uh, post questions and discuss in there without much uh, difficulty. So today we have uh, folks tuning in from uh, Chicago, California, Ecuador, Yokohama, Oregon, San Diego, uh, Burkina Faso, and uh, yes, <laughs> it's great to see you too. Uh, so. Folks, I think with that, I think it's time we begin. I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. I'm your host, Zlatko Minov from IBM Quantum Research, and today I have the pleasure of hosting David Layden from IBM Quantum, who will talk about a Quantum Enhanced Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And David joined IBM Quantum as a research staff member in 2020 after finishing his PhD at MIT, where he worked on device and application adapted quantum error correction. David's current research is at the interface of theory and experiment, which is what we'll see today, both theory and experiment, and focuses on emerging quantum devices, on using emerging quantum devices to their full potential. So with that, David, it's a pleasure to have you here on the IBM Qiskit seminar. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Zlatko. What about you? I also am doing good. I think today we're not that far away. Uh, where are you tuning in from? I'm in San Jose, California. All right, lovely. Um, at, uh, I guess, the IBM Quantum Albedin Center. So exactly. David, I think with that, take it away. All right, thank you, Zlatko. So it's a pleasure to be here today and to share what I think are exciting new results with the Qiskit community at large. In particular, I'd like to tell you all about a recent paper of the same title as this talk, in which some fellow IBMers and I developed from scratch and experimentally demonstrated a new quantum algorithm for sampling. Now, this algorithm is intended to have three features. First, it's meant to be natural to run on current quantum hardware. Second, it's meant to be not completely heuristic, but rather to have some formal guarantees of producing the right answer. And third, it's meant to be eventually useful in the sense that it solves some problem of pre-existing interest. So my talk is gonna be broken down into four parts, uh, and I figure I can maybe pause for questions after each one. So the first part has to do with this problem of interest, which is a sampling problem. I'm going to start by introducing this as well as some of the classical algorithms that are currently used to solve it. These will lay the foundation for our quantum algorithm, which will then take for a test drive using both simulations and finally experiments on our superconducting quantum devices. <clears throat> so I'd like to dive in and get some math out of the way in one slide and then take a step back for a broader context. Putting our theory hats on to begin, the underlying setting for this problem is the classical Ising model, where each model instance is defined by this function here, called an energy function, where these coefficients, j and h, are arbitrary real numbers that are given to us as part of the problem specification. And together, they define this function, e of s, that assigns some real scalar value, that's often called an energy, to every n-bit string s. Now, <clears throat> Uh, physicists will often call uh, the various bits of S spins, and they'll sometimes call S a spin configuration. And um, I'm going to stick with the convention of having these bits be have values plus or minus one. If you prefer to do this in terms of zeros and ones, that's, of course, equivalent. Just the math works out a little nicer this way. <clears throat> 
Now, an energy function like this is often illustrated as a sort of landscape, like I'm showing to the right. And it's useful to visualize things in this way, but you should keep in mind that this is not a completely faithful representation for two main reasons. The first is that the space of n-bit strings is not naturally one-dimensional, like I'm showing it here along the x-axis. It's just a lot easier to visualize this way. And the second is that there are, of course, finitely many n-bit strings. And so really, E of s shouldn't strictly be a curve like I'm showing here, but it should be a series of dots. However, because there would be exponentially many such dots squished into this plot here, uh, it's somewhat reasonable to picture it in this way. Now, this energy function is not a probability distribution, but it does in turn define the distribution that we're going to be in, uh, interested in today, namely the Boltzmann distribution, which I'm going to represent with the letter mu. Now, this Boltzmann distribution assigns some probability to every n-bit string that's proportional to the negative exponential of the energy of that string divided by some uh, scaling factor t. Now, this z term out front is called the partition function, and it's just a normalizing coefficient. It's just there to ensure that all of these probabilities sum to one. And <clears throat> the scaling factor t is often called the temperature in physics, and it's just some arbitrary positive number that's given to us as part of the problem specification. So what does this Boltzmann distribution look like? Well, in the limit of very low temperature, it assigns 100% probability to the ground state. In other words, the n-bit string that has the lowest value of, the ener of energy. Um, in the opposite limit of very high temperatures, it instead tends towards the uniform distribution. In other words, it assigns the same probability to every n-bit string. The hard regime that we're going to be interested in is the one that's somewhere between these two where the Boltzmann distribution assigns substantial probability not just to the ground state, but rather to several low energy states that can be far apart from each other in this uh, energy landscape. Now, these are both very simple looking equations, but this Boltzmann distribution can be surprisingly hard to work with computationally. And a big part of the reason why is because we're dealing with an exponentially large state space of n-bit strings. And so one of the immediate effects that this has is that the partition function here, this z term out front that ensures normalization, is in general not computationally tractable. And the reason why is because it involves a sum over exponentially many terms. And so all you need is a problem instance that has a few hundred bits, and in principle at least, your partition function involves a sum over more terms than there are atoms in the universe. So in general, we cannot evaluate this z, and it also means in turn that we can actually typically, or we can't in general, actually work out what the values of these Boltzmann probabilities are. We can write down the equation, but it's hard to get actual numbers out of it. So ultimately, the task that we're going to be interested in is drawing random samples from this Boltzmann distribution in blue here. And one of the big challenges that we're going to be faced with is that we can write down this equation, but we don't actually know what the values of these probabilities should be. In other words, we don't actually see this blue curve, this distribution. Instead, the only thing that we can computationally access efficiently uh, is the energy function that defines the distribution. So to be more concrete about what we're trying to do here, the idea is that we're given coefficients j and h together with some temperature t as part of a problem specification. And then we're tasked with outputting random n-bit strings such that the probability that I output any given string s is just the Boltzmann probability of s. And <clears throat> we could also have some error tolerance here. So maybe the probability is just close to within some specified epsilon. Now, the main figure of merit that we're going to be concerned with here is the time complexity. In other words, how many computational steps does it take me to start producing these samples? Now, as promised, let's take a step back and talk about where this arises. Um, if you haven't encountered this problem before, uh, you might wonder why we care about it. It certainly seems very abstract. And historically, where this first arose was in physics, where the Ising model was proposed as an early model of magnetism in materials and where the Boltzmann distribution describes a thermal equilibrium. <clears throat> now, where the sampling comes in is if you wanted to compute thermal averages of quantities F that could be physical observables like the magnetization, or they could be, for instance, correlations between different spins. Now, 
in principle, the thermal average, uh, if you write out the expectation value, it involves a sum over exponentially many terms, where each term also depends on this partition function, which is also exponentially hard to find in general. Um, however, uh, <clears throat> a useful shortcut is to use Monte Carlo instead. In other words, to somehow generate uh, samples according to the Boltzmann distribution and to plug this into this expression on the right here. And this can often give you a very good approximation to the exact value of the Boltzmann average of F um, <clears throat> using uh, in much less time, so uh, at a much lower computational cost. This exact same trick is also used in machine learning, specifically in Boltzmann machines, which are just classical Ising models that are invoked for generative modeling. And in fact, this sampling problem is used both uh, arises both in the training and the inference steps, and it can be a bottleneck in both. I should also say as a side note that when this Boltzmann distribution arises in the context of computer science, people typically don't write the temperature of this T explicitly, rather it's typically just implicitly absorbed into the scale of the energy function, but I'm going to stick with the, uh, the physics convention throughout. Finally, the sampling problem arises as a subroutine in some, uh, some algorithms for combinatorial optimization. So if you were interested in finding the ground state of this energy function, you, one strategy you can imagine is to uh, try and sample from the Boltzmann distribution at a near zero temperature. Now, <clears throat> doing this directly typically doesn't work that well, but there are a number of heuristic algorithms like simulated annealing or parallel tempering that try and come at it indirectly by sampling from the Boltzmann distributions at gradually decreasing temperatures. And in this way, hoping they hope to ultimately find the ground state. But now, in all of these applications, let me remind you of the challenge that we face. We want to sample from this distribution in blue here, um, but we don't actually know what the values of these probabilities are. So how do people actually produce these samples? What are the classical algorithms for doing this? Well, there are different general classical strategies for random sampling, and one that works uh, fairly well in high dimensional settings like we have here is called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC for short. And the general idea is to run a random walk over this energy landscape. So in other words, if you start at this point at some arbitrary point, like the one shown in black here, the idea is to make a random step to some other position and then another one and to, to keep exploring this uh, landscape by making random steps. Now, if at every iteration you picked your next step uniformly at random among the bit strings on this x-axis, you would find that in the long run, you spend about the same fraction of time at every one of these states. Of course, if you picked the transition probabilities uh, to be different, so you made some jumps in certain directions more frequently than others, then naturally you'd find that you start spending in the long run more time at some states and less at others. And so the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo is simply to set up an appropriate random walk like this, such that the fraction of time that you spend at any bit string S converges to the corresponding Boltzmann probability of S. And so the way you use this to produce random samples is you simply run this, uh, this carefully tuned up random walk until it's converged, and then you just start recording your position, and those give you samples distributed according to the Boltzmann distribution. David, you're doing such an excellent job of explaining this that I'm going to pepper you with a couple of uh, introductory slide questions here, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, on your first slide, you had a beautiful picture of showing um, the the blue distribution at high T, low T, and you know we kind of had this subjective notion of what's high and low. Could you just comment a little more on maybe visually how would you think about what does it mean to be at high temperature within that graph versus low temperature? What what sets that scale? Oh, sure. Yeah. So this, the scale is set by the, the energy function that you're given. So it's set by the coefficients. If someone gave you uh, a series of huge coefficients, the energy scale would be very large. And so what becomes a large and small temperature is with respect to that. Um, but I'll, I'll get into uh, a little more detail actually later as we get into experiments and, and hopefully make this a little more concrete for everyone. So for instance, you know, there was another um, minima of the curve that was further away in the x-axis, uh, but it was quite close in terms of the energy. Does it matter how close that is, for instance? Uh, does that set the scale of T 
Uh, it matters. The only thing that matters for the Boltzmann distribution is the y direction. So uh, two points that are low along y could be very far apart in x, but uh, the the Boltzmann distribution doesn't care about that. Got it. And to, a quick question also. Uh, you said it's easy to write down uh, this distribution quickly. The number of possibilities grows to more than the number of atoms in the universe and so on. What about approximate methods? Um, you know, oftentimes there are many analytical approx you know, Sterling approximations or things like that. Does, could that, how much of a role does that play here? Uh, there are there are methods to approximate the partition function. Um, I suppose you could try, you could use those um, to, as an approach for sampling, to first find the values, the probabilities, and then try to plug that in to do sampling by some other means. The point that I was hoping to get at, though, was that actually the family of algorithms that's most widely used has the nice feature of bypassing that, bypassing that altogether in the sense that this partition function that's hard to work with, or at least uh, hard to get exactly, uh, just drops out of everything. Got it. And um, final question, since you mentioned the ground state a few times, um, how how do you use this? Maybe clarify for us again. Can you use this to prepare the ground state? or? Uh, I suppose you probably could if you were to, uh, so so yes, in general, uh, this sampling is uh, used as a subroutine often, uh, like I said, to find the ground state. The caveat is that um, if you if you try to just sample directly from a very low temperature or zero temperature Boltzmann distribution, a lot of the algorithms tend to break down. That's kind of a pathological limit. Um, and um, and so the the trick around this is to try and uh, and sample at uh, at a number of different temperatures, and you're not necessarily formally guaranteed to find the ground state by doing this kind of gradual approach. But uh, in practice, it seems to work fairly well. Okay, thank you very much, David. Sure. So the idea um, that I was introducing on the previous slide was of this Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is this random walk over the energy landscape that's designed to converge to the Boltzmann distribution. And the obvious question that arises from this is, how exactly do you pick these transition probabilities in order to converge to the right distribution? This seems like it could be hard. And if so, it would mean that I've simply traded one hard problem for another and I'm no further ahead. But that's not the case. It turns out that there is a very powerful approach to doing this, and it traces back to Los Alamos in the early 50s and led to one of the early algorithms to be used on early electronic computers. And so there's a nice parallel here between that initial algorithm in the 50s uh, on early classical computers and this one that I'll talk about today on our current early quantum computers. The idea is to break down each one of these trend random, uh, random jumps into two steps. So in step one, if your current state is S, you by some means propose a new random state S prime uh, following some mechanism that I'm denoting as these blue gears here. Now I'm going to be more concrete about this in a moment about how exactly you should propose these random moves. But on this slide, the point that I want to get across is that it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, in fact, in step one, you can use almost any means you like to propose uh, your next move. And you will still converge to the Boltzmann distribution, provided you follow it up with step two. Now, in step two, you compute this quantity A that's called the acceptance probability. And this is some number that's between zero and one. And so with probability A, once you actually have the value of it, you actually complete the jump over to this new state S prime. And otherwise, you stay put at your current state S and you try again in another iteration. And so, <clears throat> If you iterate through these steps repeatedly, under very mild assumptions, you will eventually converge to the Boltzmann distribution. But now, looking at step two with this acceptance probability that you have to compute each time, you might be a little worried about this, in particular about this first fraction here, where I have a mu of s prime over mu of s, because I told you earlier that these Boltzmann probabilities are generally intractable. And so how are we supposed to actually do these steps a large number of times if it's very expensive to actually compute this quantity A? And there's a remarkable thing that happens here, which is if I write down this first fraction in terms of the Boltzmann probabilities, we see that this partition function, this normalizing factor out front here, cancels out. 
And so even though the numerator and the denominator might both take exponential time to evaluate uh, explicitly, or exactly rather, um, what we need is not actually both of these terms, but just their ratio. And it turns out that the ratio can be evaluated efficiently in at most quadratic time. Now, this is a very powerful approach. It often works very well. And in the settings where it doesn't work so well, it's often still the best tool that we have at our disposal. Now, when I say that it sometimes doesn't work well, I don't mean that it doesn't converge to the Boltzmann distribution because it does. What I mean is that it can converge very slowly. And the underlying reason has to do with an asymmetry between uphill and downhill moves. In particular, downhill moves are always accepted. So if you're currently, if your current state is this black dot here, and in step one, you propose this fo the following downhill move. Because that is decreasing in energy, it means that in step two, it'll get accepted 100% of the time. Now, uphill proposed moves are allowed in this algorithm, except they're not accepted in step two with a probability of one anymore. Instead, necessarily, in order to converge to the Boltzmann distribution, they're accepted with some smaller probability that's, <clears throat> in fact, exponentially small with how far uphill you're traveling. So if you suggested a move like this instead, it wouldn't always be accepted in step two. Now, this particular one is not so far uphill, and so it should still be accepted with an appreciable probability. But if you instead were to propose a move like this in step one that tries to escape all the way out of this local minimum in one shot, this is very far uphill, and so it's overwhelmingly uh, likely to be rejected, meaning that you would just start, uh, you would just return to where you started and try again for another iteration. And the reason why these rejected moves matter is because the clock is still ticking. So if you do an one of these iterations and you don't actually end up making the jump, that still counts as an iteration. And the net result of this asymmetry is that these algorithms tend to be quick to find their way into local minima, but then they tend to get stuck there for a long period. And I'd like to remind you that we're not just doing optimization here. The goal is not to just find the ground state and to be done with it. Uh, but rather, we were doing sampling, and the two issues that tend to make these algorithms struggle uh, are having a rough energy landscape, like I'm showing in the picture here, which is, uh, which has lots of local minima, and that's generically the case unless you have some sort of special symmetry in your problem instance, and uh, a relatively low temperature. And again, I'll elaborate more on that uh, as we get into the experiments. Now, uh, these two things together make it hard to escape local energy minima. And I don't want you picturing something like gradient descent here, where you just go down until you get stuck and then you stop altogether. A better thing to picture is like a golf ball stuck in a sand trap. So if a golfer keeps whacking away at the ball, they'll eventually get it out. It can just take a lot of iterations to actually escape and, and go somewhere else on the course. And here it's a similar thing. So be, getting stuck in these local minima for long periods makes it slow for you to explore all the various low energy regions in this landscape, which is what you need to do in order to quickly converge to the Boltzmann distribution. You need to see all the, uh, all the regions that have high Boltzmann probabilities. So that concludes the first section. Uh, Zlatko, do we have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, and Paul, we have a little spammer here, so maybe we can take care of that as well. Thank you. So a quick question. Could you give an example of a distribution where the uh, MCM, uh, MCMC methods beats the classical direct method of simulation? Um, I'm not sure what classical direct method you're talking, you're referring to, I guess. And I should also say that everything I've said so far is classical. So MCMC is very much a classical method of doing this sampling. Great. Thank you. And um, Kochan, Kochadi, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Feel free to elaborate if we misunderstood the question. Um, yes, there's a question about Benford's law. I'm not quite sure what that is uh, in this context, but... Um, you know, if, if that rings a bell, we can comment on that as well, if it has an application here. No, I'm not familiar, sorry. Okay, great. Um, I did love the golf ball stuck in a sand truck analogy. And, uh, and the, since the clock is still ticking, as you said, we'll let you go on. <laughs> sure, thank you. So what we have so far is the sampling problem that arises in several different applications. 
And uh, by and large, MCMC is the main technique to deal with it. Uh, so far, everything I've talked about is classical. It's a very powerful technique, but it can be slow to converge when you have a rough energy landscape and a uh, relatively low temperature as set by your as set by the scale of your energy function. Now, uh, it was with the goal of accelerating MCMC convergence that we developed our quantum algorithm. Now, to build up to it, I'd like to spend just a little bit longer on the classical side and talk about how exactly do you propose these moves in step one, because I haven't actually been uh, specific about that yet. The most common approach is to just pick one of your spins, uniform, your, your bits uniformly at random and to flip it. So from one to minus one and vice versa. I call this the local strategy because you're always moving a Hamming distance of exactly one over to one of the neighboring bit strings. Or in terms of this plot to the left, you're always taking a very small step, either one over to the left or one to the right. Now, why is this a reasonable approach? Well, if you had taken on the plot here, if you had taken a small step to the left instead, that would have been a downhill move. So that would always be accepted. Uh, here I'm showing a step to the right where you're going slightly, you're going uphill, but only slightly. Right? Because you've only taken a small step, there's only so much you can, so much altitude you can cover, so much energy you can gain. And so uh, this move is still reasonably likely to be accepted. Maybe a quick yeah. question since you brought this up earlier. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, you mentioned how this picture we're seeing is actually not the natural representation uh, because, and you kind of see that in the way you're flipping, you know, it's more of like a Z2 to the N uh, mm -hmm. picture, right? Um, and you know we have this continuous picture here, but uh, you know, in what sense are things even next to each other? Or, you know, can you just have like one point that's a complete dip and everything else is high? Um, maybe, maybe just a quick comment on on how to th how to think about that in this. So, so that is a problem. You do have you can have these sharps ups and ups and downs. Um, I've tried to still kind of illustrate this in the the landscape here. It's not this kind of nice sinusoidal one, but it's got these very jagged edges. Uh, there is, however, a bound on on how sharp this can possibly be, and it's because uh, your your energy function is quadratic in the bits. Um, so if you, given that your coefficients, you know, you look at your your largest coefficient that describes the coupling between these different spins to use the physics lingo, and that basically tells you how much of a how high of a cliff you could possibly have. So, um, so as I said, it's not a it's not a perfect picture this one here, but it's not terrible either. It somehow gets at the spirit of this. Right. Thanks a lot. That's really nice to know. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> So, uh, so yeah, as I said, this local approach uh, is reasonable enough in the sense that even the uphill moves tend to get accepted a, a fair fraction of the time because they only go a little bit uphill because they're small steps. But then you can ask yourself, does that mean that th with this approach, you'll be able to easily escape from this local minimum? And the answer is no, because one of these steps isn't enough, right? Because you're only moving a little bit along the X direction. And so to actually escape from the local minimum that I've shown here, you would need several of these steps to happen in a row and for all of them to be accepted. And having a whole sequence of these in a row is very unlikely, so it doesn't happen very often. Um, and overall, the conversions can be very slow. Now, you could imagine trying to sidestep this issue by instead proposing moves using some non-local approach where the Hamming distance that you jump is much greater than one. <coughs> There are several such approaches, none of which is a silver bullet. And so to illustrate the difficulty that these face in general, I'd like to just focus on a simple limiting example, namely what I call the uniform strategy, where you just pick your next, uh, your next proposed move uniformly at random along this x-axis. So a typical move might look like this. It's a complete Hail Mary. Uh, on the one hand, you tend to jump very or tend to attempt to jump very far along the x-axis so if a move like this were accepted it would mean that in a single iteration you got out of this local minimum the downside of course is that starting from a deep local minimum like i've shown here you also tend to jump very high up in the y direction meaning that there's no free lunch and that this move is extremely unlikely to be accepted meaning again you're going to stay the, the net effect is that you end up staying stuck for long periods in this local minimum now the ideal combination of features that you might want is sort of the best of both worlds between these two strategies. It would be to have moves that look more like this, where you tend to jump far in the X direction, so have moves that are uh, a large Hamming distance away from your current state, and 
but to stay fairly close in energy along the y direction so that even moves that are uphill are still accepted with a region reasonably large probability that's kind of your wish list now i'm going to put the uh two steps of our algorithm back on the screen as a reminder here and what I showed you on the last slide were a couple of potential choices of how to propose moves in step one. Now, uh, the convergence to the Boltzmann distribution is guaranteed no matter what. Um, but as I alluded to, the rate of convergence can depend very strongly on how you're proposing these moves in the first step. And so if you are trying to speed up convergence, you might be tempted <clears throat> to look for some sophisticated and perhaps complicated way of proposing moves in step one as these blue gears here. But you have to be very careful about this, because if you pick something that's too complicated in step one, you'll pay dearly for it in step two. Because remember that you have to every time go and compute this number A, that's some probability. And that number A has this funny dependence uh, on this fraction in blue here, which is some property of how you're proposing the moves. And so if you're proposing moves by some very complicated means uh, that's so complicated that you can't efficiently evaluate this fraction here, then the whole thing falls apart because you can't just it, uh, rapidly iterate through these steps. And so with this warning in mind, let me introduce our quantum algorithm in which we use a quantum processor to propose these random moves and then a classical processor to accept or reject them. So specifically in step one of this algorithm, if the current state of your Markov chain is some bit string S, you go to your quantum computer and prepare the corresponding computational state. You then simulate evolution by uh, the following Hamiltonian, which is a transverse field Ising model or a quantum Ising model corresponding to the classical problem instance that you're dealing with. In other words, these J's and H's are just uh, the ones given to you in the problem instance. If you were a condensed matter physicist, you might call this a quench experiment. If you were a computer scientist, you could say that we're querying the classical energy function in quantum superposition. And the reason why I say that is that this Hamiltonian, the diagonal terms are just all the classical energies and the off diagonal terms that uh, lead to entanglement um, uh, are these X's here. And now this business of querying the classical energy, I don't just mean that figuratively. I mean, if you look at this in the path integral formulation, that's exactly what's going on. The final step is then to read out your state, and that gives you some n bit string, which you call S prime. You then return to your classical computer and compute the acceptance probability, where now I've written out this famous blue fraction in terms of quantum mechanical notation. And so in this notation, this is a transition, uh, a ratio of transition probabilities from S to S prime and S prime to S. Now, you might be looking at this blue term and be worried because uh, in general, we expect that both the numerator and the denominator should take exponential time classically to compute. And yet you can show analytically for this Hamiltonian that regardless of what these numerator and denominator are, uh, they have to be equal to one another. In other words, this fraction has to be equal to one. You don't have to compute either term. And what you're left with for the acceptance probability is just this simple expression here that, be, that can be computed efficiently in at most quadratic time. You then on the classical computer with decide whether to make the jump with probability A to this next to this new bit string S prime or whether to stay put at S for another iteration and you pass the result back to your quantum computer and iterating through this these steps you're guaranteed to converge to the Boltzmann distribution. Now this algorithm has some interesting features. For one, under the reasonable assumption that it's hard to sample from the measurement distribution of this time evolved quantum state, it means that it's hard to mimic this algorithm or the underlying Markov chain classically. And yet this inherits the convergence guarantees from classical MCMC, by which I mean that even though it might be hard to simulate classically, you still know that it will eventually converge to the Boltzmann distribution. Moreover, <clears throat> there are some theoretical reasons to expect that the transitions suggested by this algorithm tend to be far in Hamming distance and close in energy with high probability. And I'll get into that a little later, which, uh, which is something that we see in both our simulations and our experiments. But ultimately, this algorithm is what I would call semi-heuristic in the sense that the ultimate result is guaranteed, but how fast you get there has to be established empirically, much like most classical MCMC algorithms. This is also a bit unusual for a near-term quantum algorithm <coughs> in the sense that it doesn't involve 
variational optimization or adiabatic evolution, and instead it represents a completely different algorithmic paradigm. Moreover, we often think of quantum computers as returning expectation values, like in VQE, or a string, a bit string, that encodes an answer to the problem, like in Shor's algorithm or Grover's. But fundamentally, what a quantum computer does is generate random samples. And so this algorithm uses them explicitly in this way. Moreover, because the algorithm is fundamentally stochastic, we find it to be fairly robust to noise. Um, and in particular, it doesn't just fall apart under experimental noise, but it does what you might call it fails gracefully uh, in that it gradually slows down, it gradually becomes more classical, but it still converges to the right answer. So this now concludes the second, uh, the second part. Zlatko, do we have any questions? Yeah, and folks, feel free to post questions in the chat and we'll get to them. And if I missed your question, which I think I might have missed one or two, just surf resurface them again. Um, so gamma is this new parameter you introduce in the section. Can, how should we think of it? How do we set it? Uh, just tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So gamma sets the relative strength of the the two parts of the the quantum transitions versus how strongly you see the uh, the classical energies. Uh, that's the interpretation of it. Uh, in terms of as far as how you said it, that's actually a difficult question to which we don't have a good answer. And if someone has a good answer, by all means, I would love to hear from you. Um, what we found is that it doesn't seem to matter all that much, um, uh, by which I mean that what we end up doing in our simulations and our experiments is actually just picking gamma at random. Um, the idea being that there are, for any problem instance, there are going to be some values of gamma that are better than others. And so by just picking random values every now and then, we hit the good ones. And uh, this turns out to be enough for the algorithm to work quite well. But certainly, if you had some more clever way of, of setting this, uh, there's, there's further room for speed up. So do you, um, let me understand what, unpack what that means. So do you vary gamma within one run and convergence or it's, you do multiple convergences and you try different gammas and see which one converged better? Oh, uh, it's within a single run. So every time you go to your quantum computer, you pick a gamma at random. That's the, the way oh. we did it. Oh, so it's like doubly stochastic. <laughs> yeah. It's like a stochastic hyperparameter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I suppose. I mean, you could also think of, uh, yeah, you could think of uh, your proposing moves by some stochastic process, which, yes, in itself involves some randomness in this gamma, although I, I don't think that's an essential part of this algorithm. It was just, you know, our own ignorance about how exactly should you optimize this thing. We chose not to optimize it at all. Okay, interesting. Um, could you just give us like two seconds? Why is there that min function, min of one comma uh, ratio? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so this is... Um, it's a it's a fairly deep mathematical answer, I guess. And I should say this is not of our own making. This is uh, what I'm using here is an expression from what's called the Metropolis algorithm that dates back to the 50s. Um, the idea is just that uh, you you have to pick this acceptance probability very carefully uh, in order to ensure convergence. And so the reasons there are there are several choices that all look kind of similar. The one I'm using here involves this min, and the net effect is that it just ensures that uh, your a is some number between zero and one. If you didn't have the min, then uh, in principle it could go larger, and so you can't interpret it as a probability anymore. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, quick question from Hannah. How do you evolve? How long do you evolve the system? Uh, I will give the same answer as I did for, for gamma. Uh, for every problem instance, there are some times that are better than others. Um, there's perhaps some clever way to figure out which ones are the good values of time, but instead we just picked it at random the way we picked gamma. Uh, that turns out to work surprisingly well, uh, suggesting that this is fairly robust to how you actually set the T and the gamma parameter, because doesn't make that much difference here in the end. So when in doubt, throw a dice? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, that's what's nice about these stochastic algorithms, right? Not every move has to be good. As long as the good moves come up every now and then, you'll still converge quickly. And uh, if longer times, you're trotterizing the, the Ising evolution, right? I uh, mean, more depth, more circuits, more noise. So I suppose there's some bias uh, in, in that where you might have more benefit from short-term evolution.
Yeah, yeah, that's a question. We we kind of just used an ad hoc uh, way of doing this in our experiments uh, in the sense that we don't have a fundamental theory for what exactly is the optimal trade-off, but but certainly, yeah, in the experiment section, I'll get into uh, what, uh, what depth of circuits we use, so how many trotter steps. Okay, and um, to follow up, uh, Leanne has, in addition to the previous, the Ising model with transverse field, uh, the gamma parameter, will make it harder to calculate the energy of S the bit string, how will it affect the whole MC MC algorithm? Um, it doesn't, the the energy of S is just the class, E of S is just a classical thing. It's some function on bit strings that can be evaluated in quadratic time. It doesn't depend on the uh, this transverse field. Yeah, I think in other words, E of S doesn't include the transverse piece. Yeah, exactly. The idea is that the so rather you're moving under one Hamiltonian, but actually calculating the energy for another Hamiltonian. <laughs> yeah, well, so the idea is just that this quantum Hamiltonian, in some sense, en encompasses the whole classical problem. Great. And uh, maybe a quick, like, two second reply to Narenda. Why, why is it hard to mimic the algorithm classically? The Hamiltonian is stochastic, uh, and the path integral Monte Carlo might mimic this effective efficiently. Um, well, I guess it's not just, uh, I would imagine you could do that for the ground state, perhaps, but uh, as far as I know, for a, a, an Ising spin class, it's generically hard to simulate the dynamics. Um, I, I could be wrong about that. Perhaps a better way to say it is that it's, at the very least, uh, classically uncomfortable. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Paul, I think our spammer's back again. Thank you for lighting up our chat today. <laughs> All right, uh, there are more questions pouring in. We'll let you continue since the clock is ticking, uh, but resurface them later and we'll definitely get to them. All right, sounds good. So to recap, we have the sampling problem that we care about. We introduced this quantum algorithm uh, with the hopes of converging quickly. Uh, it is uh, classically hard, or as I said, at least classically uncomfortable, hopefully, to simulate classically. Uh, and yet uh, the convergence of the Boltzmann distribution is guaranteed. But how quickly you converge is established empirically. So we're first going to look at that through simulations. And the first thing we have to deal with is what exactly we're going to use as our figure of merit for convergence speed. Now, convergence in the space of probability distributions can be a bit of a subtle thing, and it's certainly multifaceted. However, there is a nice and unambiguous way to quantify how quickly MCMC converges, but we need to introduce a little more math for it. And I should say that this will work for any MCMC algorithm, regardless of whether it's this quantum one or a purely classical one. And so it's going to give us a nice way to compare the convergence rates of the two. So let's start by defining a matrix P, which is 2 to the n by 2 to the n dimensional. And its elements are just all the different transition probabilities between every possible bit string. I'll also define a matrix X sub K, which is two to the N dimensional. And this just gives you the distribution of your position after running K steps of this algorithm. Now, these two objects are closely related to one another in the sense that applying P to X K just propagates you forward in time by one iteration. Or in other words, applying P to the Kth power uh, to your starting distribution uh, brings you to the, the Kth step. And so this means that you will ultimately converge to the Boltzmann distribution, but the way in which you converge is fully described by this matrix P to the K. So for simplicity, I'm going to assume that P is diagonalizable, but our conclusion here will hold regardless. So if I can diagonalize P, it means I can write it in this form here for some matrix Q and some eigenvalues lambda. Uh, and you can picture these eigenvalues on the complex plane here as blue dots where one of them, as it turns out, will always be equal to one, and the other ones will always be strictly inside the unit circle. And so if you expand out this expression, p to the power of k, you'll see that a bunch of the q's and q inverses cancel out. And really what's going on is that you're just taking powers of all the different eigenvalues. And so the eigenvalue that's equal to one will stay fixed, but all the other ones will get pulled in towards the origin. And that's one way of understanding MCMC convergence. And in fact, the rate at which every one of these eigenvalues gets pulled in, all these various rates, all describe some aspect of the overall convergence. But now you might ask yourself, is one of these eigenvalues more important than the others? And the answer is yes, this one in red here is the most important one. And the reason why I say that, uh, sorry, Zlatko, was there a raised hand? 
That was my virtual clapping hands for a great explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so this one in red is the one we care most about. And the reason why I say that is because it's the closest one to the unit circle. So as you take powers of it, it's going to be the slowest one to get pulled into the origin. And in fact, the distance to the unit circle, this is what I've denoted delta here, uh, is something called the absolute spectral gap in MCMC. And it's the gold standard measure of convergence rate. The downside is that it's quite computationally expensive to find. Um, and so this highlights the fact that there's a difference between running MCMC, which is cheap, and characterizing it, which is quite expensive. And I should say this is not a quantum thing. Classical MCMC faces the exact same issue and it's widely used nonetheless. So for simplicity, I'm gonna just start calling this quantity the convergence rate. And we'd like to use it to compare different MCMC algorithms. The issue that we face, though, is that there are two factors that go into the convergence rate. There's whether your algorithm is inherently slower or faster, and then there's whether the problem instance you're looking at is inherently easier or harder, where recall that a problem instance is defined by this energy function here and these coefficients j and h that you're given. And so in order to, uh, to just isolate the performance of the algorithms, what we did is uh, got rid of this second factor, the dependence on the problem instance, by generating a whole lot of problem instances at random, by drawing these, sampling these coefficients randomly, and then looking at the resulting convergence rates for different algorithms resulting from each and talking and looking at the averages. So this will leave us with two knobs that we have to control the difficulty. Uh, we have the number of bits, n, which is the problem size, and then we have the temperature, t, which is the, the ruggedness, if you will. It effectively scales the energy function. And so because, uh, and actually I should say also that at high temperatures, we expect uh, MCMC classically to converge fairly quickly. Uh, I won't elaborate on that, but you'll see it play out in our numerics. At very low temperatures, uh, this effectively reduces to an optimization problem, which is, of course, very important, but it's not what we're directly interested in here. And instead, we're going to look at this intermediate regime primarily, where we expect the difficulty to increase quickly with the problem size. So because we have this two-dimensional parameter space to control the difficulty, there's two natural ways to visualize our simulation results. The first is to take a vertical slice where we hold the number of spins fixed and we vary the temperature. And so here what I'm showing is the convergence rate on the y-axis with compared to the temperature for a fixed number of bits uh, equal to 10. And I'm showing the convergence rate on average for uh, the classical MCMC algorithm with a local proposal. And so as you can see, at, at kind of middle temperatures here, the convergence is quite fast, but the performance drops off quite sharply at both high and low T. The other way to view the same data is uh, to take a horizontal slice instead, so to hold the temperature fixed, but to vary the problem size. And so doing this, we see that on the average case at a temperature of one, uh, the convergence rate of this classical algorithm drops off about exponentially. Now, we can also look at this for another classical strategy of MCMC, namely where you propose moves uniformly at random. And so here we see that the very high and very low T performance is faster. We get larger values of the convergence rate. And in the intermediate regime, it's about the same, even a little worse. And similarly, the scaling is also look, uh, looking exponential in the average case. Uh, and um, in fact, the, the slope is slightly worse for this gray one. Now, for comparison, let me show you the results for the simulations of our quantum algorithm where at, in the left panel at high T, uh, it doesn't outperform the classical algorithms, but as the temperature decreases and we enter this difficult regime, the convergence end, ends up being substantially faster in the average case. On the right panel, we see a similar effect. We see a scaling that still seems to decay exponentially with problem size. In other words, we're not seeing anything like an exponential enhancement here. So this is not like Shor's algorithm, for instance. Instead, it's more analogous to the speed up you get from Grover's algorithm, a polynomial enhancement. Um, of course, instead of a quadratic enhancement here in the average case, we're seeing something from these fits that is between cubic and quartic. Uh, here in particular, the slope gives you a, a power of 3.6 enhancement. Um, the plots here look a little different depending on what precise parameters you choose, like different temperatures, uh, but this cubic to quartic average case enhancement uh, holds up quite robustly regardless of this choice. So that concludes our simulations. And before diving into the last sections, Latko, do we have any questions? <laughs>
Yes, thank you. That's uh, first of all, really appreciate those beautiful curves. That's really nice. Um, the first question is about the slide with the P matrix from uh, Narendra. How is it? Oh, sorry. Actually, let's take this one from Leanne first. Um, sorry, maybe missed something. How could the eigenvalue lambda be complex since the matrix P is real? A real matrices can have complex eigenvalues. Okay, I guess, I guess it's not that. symmetric. Uh, is no, the exactly. yeah. Great. And uh, from Narenda, how uh, how does this proposed method compare with quantum annealing and quantum imaginary time evolution algorithms? I would say the short answer is that it doesn't because it solves a different problem. Uh, those are both optimization algorithms, whereas here we're explicitly concerned with sampling, which is why I'm not focusing so much on the, the very low temperature limit, but rather this intermediate case where the problem doesn't just come down to finding the ground state. Excellent. Um... Uh, the expectation value of, I think I missed when this question was, so let's see if I can remember. The expectation from Akif, the expectation value equates to one in the quantum algorithm. Is it only valid for the transverse field Ising model or in general equates to one? If not, how does it give advantage to a general Hamiltonian? Do you remember what that, I that was a question from a, a while ago, so I'm not sure what slide this refers to. So Akif, feel free to clarify, unless we're clear on what the question is, we can just move on. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's been any expectation values of unobservable anywhere here. Okay, yeah. we'll come back to it. Um, please clarify in the chat box. Yeah, all right. So, um, so what I've shown you so far are noiseless classical simulations. And what this allowed us to do is look at a large number of random instances and to extract the average case behavior from them. Now, we can't do that in experiments, of course, but what we can do in our experiments is to zoom in on a few illustrative instances uh, and really get to understand them. And ultimately, what the experiments teach us that these simulations don't is how this algorithm responds to physical noise in our real devices, which can be hard to simulate precisely. So a question that I, I had that I forgot, you had error bars um, in the previous slide. Those error bars were because you ran many instances and they're just showing the sample distribution. That's right. Yeah, it's the sample standard deviation. OK, got it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we can change gears a little here and put our experiment hats on. Uh, Zlatko, I, if I do this part in full, I'm going to go over time because of the questions. Should I cut out some of the details of the how and just get to the, the punchline, or should I take my time? Um, we've had so many questions throughout the talk that we can cut some of the time off the questions at the end and just let you have a little more time. So you can, you can run you know, five, 10 minutes over. It's fine. OK, sure. <laughs> All right, so um, let me tell you about how we implemented this algorithm on IBM superconducting quantum devices using Qiskit. So the quantum step of our algorithm involves uh, simulating the transverse field Ising model uh, for random kind of glassy parameters. And so what we did is break down our total Hamiltonian into two terms, H1 and H2, that contain all the single body and two body terms respectively. We then approximated the continuous evolution using a Trotter or second order product formula, the two turn out to be equivalent here, um, using some number of time steps R. Um, now, in, uh, if you were to increase the number of time steps, you would cut back on your discretization error, or your Trotter error here. But um, as I think we mentioned earlier, you would also increase uh, the accumulated gate errors. And so what you're looking is some kind of trade off between these two. And uh, that depends on the strength of the noise in your device. And for us, uh, a good trade-off was to use up to about 24 time steps, uh, which gives you a circuit of uh, with 48 uh, layers of parallel two qubit gates that looks like this. So the idea is that you're starting off with some bit string that comes from the current state of your algorithm. You go and you prepare that computational state, and then you do the following gates. You start with a layer of single qubit rotations where the parameters come from your Hamiltonian here, your H1 term. And then you do a small time step by your H2 term, which we have to decompose into two steps. We do a series of two qubit RZZ rotations on the even pair or on the odd pairs of qubits, and then another one on the even pairs of qubits. And we iterate through this, do a measurement at the end, and then use your uh, our bit string uh, coming out as our proposed move. How many C naughts did the RZZ take? 
Uh, that's a good question. So uh, let me say that uh, to, to get to that, because we're never dealing with expectation values here, we're, we're really just sampling the output from a quantum circuit. Uh, we did not use any error mitigation, but instead we used some different tricks to manage the noise, including uh, how we did these RZC gates. So of course, these are not basis gates for our devices. Rather, I've been just writing them like this as shorthand because we have to realize them in a composite way. So the textbook way of doing this is to do a pair of C knots with an RZ rotation in the middle. Now, the way that these are realized in our devices are through cross resonance gates that implement an RZX rotation by an angle of pi over two, together with some single qubit gates. Now, in our experiments, we had an average C naught fidelity and calibration, or sorry, an average uh, C naught error from our calibrations of about 0.66%. But rather than uh, actually doing the RZZs this way using two C naughts, what we did instead was uh, an RZX rotation by uh, the, the target angle directly, which is significantly smaller than pi over two, although the angle depends on the, the uh, coefficients in your Hamiltonian. And so we ended up actually implementing this circuit on the right here, where the H's are Hadamard gates. Um, I will refer you to this detail uh, to this paper from some of my colleagues for details of uh, the uh, enhancement in fidelity that you get by using this approach here of using a single partially entangling gate uh, as compared to two fully entangling gates. Uh, but suffice it to say, suffice it to say that this gives you circuits that are much shorter in time and in turn uh, have significantly higher fidelity. So um, this was the main trick we used in order to reduce the noise, but what we cared about is not just the noise strength, but also the noise structure. And by that, I mean that our algorithm assumes that the probability of transitioning from S to S prime is equal to that from S prime to S. Um, that's what we need in order for this acceptance probability to be efficiently computable. Uh, and that's true in principle for this circuit, <laughs> but uh, actual device noise could break this symmetry. And the two main sources of error that we were most concerned with were those uh, the two qubit gates and the readout. So starting with the readout, uh, what could happen, for instance, is that a readout error in which a one becomes a zero can be more likely than one for the opposite process. And so what this does is it biases you towards certain bit strings and in effect, it breaks this required symmetry. So the way we handled this was before actually implementing a circuit, we picked some uniformly random subset of qubits and we, at least in principle, added a pair of X gates before the readout. And, and this is something that Zlatko would know about. Uh, they, they have a nice paper on a, a very similar trick. Um, instead of actually implementing these through pulses, we pulled one of these X gates through the read, readouts, meaning we just did a measurement and then flipped the resulting bit. And um, the other one we pulled all the way through to the start of the circuit and then similarly absorbed into the initial state. The net result being something like this, where the overall structure of the circuit stays the same, but some of the angles pick up uh, negative signs and you end up having to flip some of the classical bits at both the input and the output. And so on average, this has the effect not so much of reducing the strength of your readout error, but rather of reducing the bias and removing any sort of preferred direction where you get pulled towards some bit strings and away from others. Um, and so it, this is one big step towards uh, making sure that we, we have this required symmetry. And just to clarify that, that's only for the readout noise mechanism, right? You could still have some asymmetry due to the time evolution and errors that you have in there. Uh, well, so the the unitary that this produces uh, does have this property in theory. So the you could have it due to gate errors, I guess, is the remaining thing that we're concerned about. Uh, sorry, I think you're muted. The, oh, yeah, sorry, was I muted? The noisy non-unitary, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so the, the last remaining error source that we were concerned with are the two qubit gates, where we played a similar randomization trick as I just described for the readout. Now, if our two qubit gates were Clifford's, like C-naughts, uh, we could just use poly twirling, but uh, here they're explicitly non-Clifford, and so we had to do something a little different, but with a very similar effect. Uh, namely, every time an RZX gate arose in our circuits, we picked uh, single qubit unitaries, P1 and P2, at random, and we added them both before and after the gate. Um, if they commuted with ZX, we did this circuit here. And if instead the anti-commuted, we did this other circuit to the right where everything looks the same, but uh, in order to realize the same unitary, you have to flip the sign of this rotation angle theta. And so the net effect of this is to effectively twirl away uh, any asymmetry in these um, 
in these in the noise on these two qubit gates and with both the randomization in the gates and the readout uh, we were, were able to remove uh, any detectable asymmetry in our device noise as required by the algorithm okay wait this is very interesting let me pause you for a second so i understand sure. um so instead of the normal twirling where insert polys on either end uh, or in the beginning p1 p1 dagger and then you push the p1 dagger by conjugating it by the your gate which in this case you can't do because your rzx is um, non Clifford, so it doesn't map a poly to a poly or to a single qubit uh, product. Um, you're saying that for whatever, basically, is this a, this is a property of the RZX specific of the ZX specifically? I guess is that. Can you uh, say a little uh, more about yeah? Uh, a rotation by any like e to the any tensor product of two polys mm -hmm. will you can play this trick. So it means that those two polys. Yeah give you kind of a partition of the the 16 possible two qubit polys into either commuting or anti-commuting uh and so if they commute you can just use the middle circuit and if they anti-commute you can just flip the sign and you get the same effect that's right i guess because you get some sine of theta ii plus cosine of theta the two pro the you know zx for instance um and uh that's nice and do you know what what is the effect on the noise channel that uh you know with twirling you diagonalize the noise channel in the poly basis does this have the same effect yeah so we didn't characterize this in detail here what we cared about was the symmetry which was this was enough to do it um, under the assumption that the um that the noise channel does not uh depend on the sign of your rzx rotation angle this reduces to poly twirling basically so it diagonalizes and the it diagonalizes the uh, the chi matrix of the noise um, the the poly transfer matrix, I think you mean. Well, both, either one. The, yeah, yeah, the, they're yeah up to a change of basis to the same thing. In the right base, yeah, yeah, that's right. I guess the chi matrix in the poly basis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Uh, okay, very cool, very very cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and and of course, the last step here is we don't leave whole sequences of single qubit gates next to each other. We concatenate them together wherever possible. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, now I'm catching up. The reason that, um, yeah, the reason this really works is because you can you ma you can flip the angle theta, because if you restrict yourself to only working with the RZX of theta, you're kind of screwed. But yeah, if you allow yeah. yourself this this uh, extra two qubit gate, then you're fine. Um, yeah. How do you, do you have to calibrate both RZX of theta and RZX of minus theta separately, or is it one calibration? Um, we actually did no calibration, or rather we used the existing C0 calibration. This is the way it's done by default in Qiskit now. You could calibrate them if you wanted to, but it, it works actually fairly well to just take your cross-resonance uh, pulse and just shorten the, the flat top portion of it. And uh, this does a pretty good job actually of getting you your target angle. Oh, interesting. So they're all pretty much in the linear regime. Yeah, yeah, we made sure to stay there. Actually, once you start changing the amplitude, then uh, it gets a little, uh, a little dicier. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So uh, let me try and just get into the results in the interest of time here. So we did several different experiments, but I'm going to just show you results for a particular illustrative uh, problem instance with 10 spins. And uh, we picked this instance uh, because it's it's quite ugly. Uh, its energy landscape qualitatively is pretty similar to what I've been showing here throughout in the sense that it has a ton of local minima. In fact, it's actually kind of worse than the one I've been showing here in, because um, of the 1,024 different bit strings, uh, the six lowest energy ones are all local minima. And in fact, the two lowest are nearly degenerate with one another. So it's, it's like this, but even kind of worse. So uh, to show you how th these two classical MCMC algorithms perform on this problem instance, they, they both stick pretty close to the averages that I showed you in the simulations earlier. Um, and in contrast, uh, our quantum algorithm in, in classical simulations, at least with no noise, should give us the following convergence rate shown by the dotted line. What we actually observe in our experiments is instead this solid red line here, where the error bands uh, denote 99% confidence intervals. And so as you can see, uh, in the intermediate and low temperature regimes, the convergence is slower than it would be ideally without noise. And we attribute this to being uh, to, to being kind of a mixture of the ideal quantum and, uh, and a classical approach because of uh, device noise. 
but uh, we're still substantially faster than either of these two classical alternatives. And uh, in fact, a number of other more sophisticated classical methods that I haven't gotten into here in the interest of time. Meaning that uh, we, even despite experimental imperfections, are able to do MCMC uh, with a quantum enhancement and convergence rate as measured by the number of iterations required to converge. So this is a fairly uh, all-encompassing but abstract figure of merit, this, this broad convergence rate. So let me show you an experiment that's more concrete. What we did is we used our algorithm for what's kind of a classic uh, application of MCMC in this setting, which is to estimate, uh, which is to look at the magnetization. So the magnetization, this is a physics concept for some n-bit string, it's just the fraction of up spins minus the fraction, or the, the fraction of spins equal to one minus the fraction of spins equal to minus one for any bit string s. And uh, what we're looking at is the Boltzmann average of this magnetization with respect to the, again, the classical Ising model that we're looking at. Now, instead of evaluating this out explicitly, which involves exponentially many terms, a typical application of MCMC is to try and to just generate these samples to run this random walk uh, and to use uh, to compute the, the running average uh, value when you plug in this expression, which should eventually converge to the true Boltzmann average magnetization. Now, we did this for a temperature, uh, so this is what I, I mean with a, an intermediate temperature. For this particular energy landscape that we're working with, we picked a temperature of 10 to the minus 1. I'd like to emphasize that this has nothing at all to do with the temperature of our physical superconducting device. This is just a parameter in the problem that can be picked arbitrarily. And in particular, we picked this so that for this particular problem, it's not just optimization. The Boltzmann distribution is not just peaked on <coughs> on the ground state, but rather uh, it has substantial probability on the four lowest energy states that are all quite far apart from one another. In other words, at this temperature, the Boltzmann distribution looks very much like this blue distribution that I've been showing throughout here. It's got substantial weight at a number of far apart places. And so uh, what I'm showing on the plot here is the performance of a classical algorithm. So I'm showing the current magnetization uh, with respect to the number of MCMC iterations for the local classical MCMC. And what we're seeing, and I, I've labeled the ground first, second, and third excited state magnetizations. So what we're seeing here is that the algorithm, as promised, uh, converge, uh, descends very quickly into a local minimum uh, here, the third excited state, and then it basically stays stuck there. And so if you were to then use this, uh, or, or actually many such Markov chains to compute a running average, you would see that it doesn't really seem to converge on the, the bottom plot here to the true value of the Boltzmann average magnetization. Um, of course, in principle, it has to converge. Eventually, you just have to look over much longer timescales here on the order of tens of millions of iterations. We can show the same, uh, or we can show similar data for another classical algorithm where you pick your uh, moves uniformly. And here we see a similar thing. You descend quickly into a local minimum. You maybe jump a little more successfully between them, but you still tend to stay stuck for hundreds of iterations at a time in the top plot. And the net result in the bottom plot is that you converge similarly slowly. Now, what I'm showing in red is experimental data for the implementation of our quantum algorithm, where you can see it also finds its way quickly into a local minimum, but unlike the two classical alternatives, it's able to very quickly jump between them. And the net result in the bottom plot is that on the scale of hundreds of iterations, it converges uh, to the exact value of the Boltzmann average magnetization without ever having to actually evaluate the expectation value explicitly. And so for the, the last slide of data, uh, let's look at what is the mechanism underlying this uh, observed quantum enhancement and convergence rate. So I said in an earlier slide that the local uh, classical uh, algorithm works by making these very small steps, both in Hamming distance and in energy, so along the x and the y directions here. So uh, if we look at the empirical distribution of how far do you jump in Hamming distance for, for this problem instance, we see that the, the, uh, the integrated histogram is peaked, or it has a step rather, at a Hamming distance of 1. So you always move a distance of 1. It's completely concentrated there. On the other hand, if we look at what's the distribution of your energy change along the y direction, uh, we see that it's also fairly sharply, uh, it's also a fairly concentrated distribution. In other words, you don't tend to move up very far in the y direction. I should say that I'm showing integrated histograms here or cumulative histograms uh, as opposed to just normal ones because I, I don't want to do any binning here. So if you want to think in terms of histograms, you take the derivative of these curves. <clears throat> 
Now, if you uh, now I said that um, the uniform proposal was kind of the opposite limit, where you tend to make very large steps both in X and in Y. And this is reflected in the distribution on both of these plots. So on the left, how far you go in Hamming distance is very spread out. You can go very far now. You're not just stuck at a Hamming distance of one. But the price you pay is that you also tend to move very far in the Y direction. Now, if we plot these distributions for our quantum algorithm, for simulations, we see something uh, that a move that looks kind of like what we had hoped for, in the sense that we tend to move quite far in the x direction, but not very far in the y direction. And um, in particular, we see on the plot on the left here that our distribution of Hamming distance looks very much like that the uniform uh, strategy. In other words, we jump very far along x. But if we look at our distribution of energy change in the right here, it looks very much like the local strategy. So we don't tend to go up or down very far. And if we compare this with our experimental data, we see very much the same features, but now they're blended a little bit. They, they become a little more classical uh, due to noise in our device. So that concludes the experiment portion. And to wrap up, let me just uh, end with one last slide. And I'd like to say that looking forward, if we want to implement this algorithm at larger scales, uh, we're going to need different and narrower figures of merit. And the reason why is, as I said earlier, the steps of the algorithm themselves are efficient, but comprehensively characterizing how it converges in terms of probability distributions is very inefficient and does not scale well. So the natural thing to do here is to try plugging this in directly into applications that use this sort of sampling and to try and focus on application specific figures of merit instead of this all encompassing one that we used for this first initial demonstration. A concrete example of this uh, might be in classical machine learning where the sampling problem, as I mentioned, uh, can be a computational bottleneck in training certain types of machine learning models like Boltzmann machines. And in fact, uh, the classic book, Deep Learning, uh, calls improved sampling techniques a potential research frontier for machine learning. Now, to be clear, what I'm talking about here is not quantum machine learning, as the term is typically understood, but rather classical machine learning, a classical model, but rather with a quantum enhanced subroutine. And to finally conclude with the big picture, um, I would say that I would note that uh, current quantum devices are good at sampling from complicated distributions. And what we have effectively done is propose an algorithm that carefully uses a classical outer loop in order to channel this ability into something useful. And what it lets you do is use existing and near-term quantum computers to sample from complicated distributions arising in subroutines of actual applications, not just distributions that are meant to be pathologically hard. And on that note, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Great job, David. Really wonderful explanations. Thank you so much. We Folks, um, please repost your questions in the comment chat box on YouTube. And uh, we have uh, our first question. So from Leanne, to pop up my question again, what is the effect of rougher trotterization step R on the performance? For example, if we put R equals to five, how does the performance get better or worse? Uh, it would probably get, I would imagine it gets worse uh, probably in an erratic way. Uh, this is generally an issue, I think, with trotterization that's not really unique to this algorithm, which is that when you're kind of deep into the regime where you expect the the uh, the discretization to be reasonably good, uh, then the error of whatever you're looking at, be it you know MCMC convergence rate or some expectation value, the error tends to to kind of scale in a nice way. But when you get if you're far out of this regime, say using five steps, like you said, uh, you can get these huge unpredictable oscillations in your error. So I would not be optimistic about how that works, but for any particular case, it's hard to say exactly how it'll break down. Great, thank you. Um, could you remind us for the experiment, what was the, the qubit size that you used? Uh, 10 qubits for the one, the data I showed you. And uh, why not? more <laughs> uh because of how uh, there were a few constraints but a big one is uh our figure of merit right we uh we wanted to uh to capture the full picture of convergence rate the the gold standard being this absolute spectral gap and uh that is that requires exponentially many samples and then takes exponential classical resources to compute um and uh and so yeah the experiments uh, quickly become unreasonably long uh, if you want to keep this gold standard uh, figure of merit the classical experiments 
uh, well, I mean, the the computation, the classical computation time blows up too. But I think the thing that's most painful is how many samples you need. Okay. This is two to the n or to four to the n probably. Um, but if you wanted to scale your quantum enhanced algorithm to more and more qubits, you could do that. Yeah, well, so I, as I said, there's the separation between, and this shows up in classical MCMC2, which is that running it is fast, but then characterizing in a very rigorous way, how fast does it all converge? That's very expensive. Uh, and so in practice, people tend to lean more on heuristic methods of doing that. But for an initial demonstration, we want it to be convincing. And so that that sets a, a limit on how far you can really go. Right. Yeah. I guess, I mean, as a subroutine to something else, uh, if you're not interested in characterizing it, but applying it, for instance. Um, we have a comment also. Yes, I, I read David's new PRL paper about the Trotter error. It's very nice work. So congrats. <laughs> and uh, a quick question on any applications to game theory. Oh, interesting. Um, no, I hadn't thought of that, but maybe there are. I, uh, whoever the, the, the person asking is, I'd love to hear from you if you have any ideas. Okay, excellent. So folks, uh, feel free to post any final questions I might have missed. I'm sure I did miss a few. Um, otherwise, seeing as we have peppered you with questions, uh, which I think indicates the uh, amount of positive interest and uh, um, interest in the work, I think that maybe we'll just give the floor to you to add any final closing words. Yeah, nothing in particular to add. Just uh, thank you all for tuning in and uh, thanks for the interest. David, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, we don't give these out lightly. And uh, folks, with that, it has been our pleasure. We will see you next Friday at noon Eastern time. We'll talk about quantum advantage in learning. And uh, hit the subscribe button if you want to stay up to date on what's coming up. This video will stay recorded so you can go back and rewatch it. But Friday at noon Eastern time is the only time when you get to interact with David and myself and folks like this live. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.